Aloha and welcome to Goddess Unleashed. This is Diane Vick and today I'm excited to bring Lynn Riley on my show. She's one of the co-authors in the book Crappy to Happy. So we're all experiencing this new world where we're being interviewed ahead of time and it's going to be launched in October when this book comes out. And I'm excited to bring her on because a lot of the practices that she shares and she teaches with her clients is a lot of the stuff that I believe is so essential and important on a healing journey. One of the things that I read um, when I first came across Lynn's uh, work is serendipity. So I want Lynn to introduce herself and really share and spread her message about serendipity because I absolutely love that word. And when I saw the movie Serendipity, I think that was the most magical experience. So let us know why serendipity and who are you, Lynn? Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I love serendipity. And that word came to me when I was when I first developed my healing business years back. And I was walking around my neighborhood. That's when I get like my best information. I would start with a question and say, what do I need to know? Or what can I, how can I be helped with this or whatever? And I remember exactly where I was, the turn I was when I kept hearing, it's an S word. It's an S word. Your business name is an S word. I'm like, what is it? What is it? And I heard serendipity. And I was like, oh, I love that word. It's so beautiful. What I didn't know at the time was what that was actually going to mean to me and for me and in the work moving forward. And really what, was, what it was, was my introduction into that aspect of my work and looking at life in a serendipitous fashion or looking at the serendipity of life. And so, and what that really means is when we think of serendipity, it's the things happen by chance and it's sort of like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. I can't believe that happened. Like what a coincidence. And then beginning to recognize that really it's, synchro it's synchronicity and that is serendipity and that things are actually happening in this magical, cool way for us. And that means all of our experiences are actually happening in an interesting, weirdly magical, uncomfortable way at times for us. And the more that we are able to see it from that perception perspective, the more that we're able to be open to what happens next instead of fearful or dreading what happens next, the more that we're able to trust the process of life instead of trying to control it and manipulate it. I love that. That kind of reminds me a little bit about wabi-sabi. I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but it's like an ancient Japanese phrase. And what it means is appreciating life with all its imperfections. Oh, so, yeah. you know, enjoying things in the moment and, and really laughing at them when they're happening and not getting so upset about the situation, you know, just having fun with it. Um, but I love how you came up with that and that you like going out in nature and you get inspired in nature. Cause for me, nature is like the absolute inspiration. I actually do my yoga every morning outside, mm -hmm. um, regardless of where I'm at. Sometimes I sneak to my neighbor's backyard. Sometimes here in the keys, I'll go outside. But I think nature is a really critical element for us to help connect with ourselves just by going out there. Absolutely. Yeah. So before, before we started recording, we talked about something that I thought was kind of cool, which I do. So I have, two books that I published. One's a kid's, I have three. One's a kid's book, but I go to the adult books and some days I ask questions. What do I need to see? So this is my alter ego, Veronica Rose, um, romantic novel. So sometimes I'll ask questions in that one and I'll go to my book about IBS and ask myself. And I know that you do the same thing. Sometimes we need to see these things. So tell us about your book, which is 30 days to me um, and how that experience works for you. Well, 30 Days to Me was absolutely a serendipitous creation that came to me at a time that I was a mess, you know, a complete puddle of myself, just disconnected. I was doing all the things I thought I was supposed to be doing in terms of what was right for me. And I was on the right path and doing, you know, I just like literally ripped apart my life. I was divorced. I got, I quit my job. I was like on this new path and like everything's kind of full steam ahead in the direction that felt right, but I still felt like garbage. I just felt depleted. I felt anxious. I felt like even though things were on the outside going right internally, didn't feel good. And I had this moment where I was sitting on my porch, just crying, saying like, I don't understand. Why is this happening to me? What am I doing wrong? What am I missing? And I heard the little intuitive voice say to me, you, you're missing you, which is actually my segment in the book. That's the title of my segment. And that voice 
myself, right? That connection to, to the universe was saying to me, you've put everybody else ahead of you your entire life and all your energy is going out, out, out and there's not enough energy coming back into you. And so that was my kind of aha moment of, okay, I'm listening. What, is, what does that mean, right? We're told connect to yourself, like spend some time. And I had been dating myself at that point, literally taking myself on dates after my divorce to get to know myself and my likes and my interests, but it wasn't quite cutting it. And so what came was uh, the suggestion, take the next 30 days to connect to yourself, do things you like, make a list of things you enjoy. And that's what I did. I made a list of things I enjoyed. And what happened was each day I committed to doing one thing that I enjoyed, whether it was five minutes or 15 minutes or an hour or whatever it was to commit to myself, to loving myself, connecting to myself. And as that was happening, when I was in a joyful state, our mood changes, our energy changes, our vibration changes, and we're more connected to the heart, connected to the universe. And I would get more. So I would get like an intuitive question that would come to me, an introspective question asking me, what does freedom mean to you? What does it feel like? And I was like, ooh, that's a good question. What does it mean to me? So I'd write these things down. Or it might be it, one of you know the days was an activity, which was, um, create a tradition. I love traditions. I had a very chaotic home that I grew up in. So the things that made me feel safe were traditions. So one of the day was create a tradition. So you have that place like a ritual, right? That you can return to that feels like a nice safe. When everything changes, I can still come back to my tradition and feel comfortable and at home. And my tradition was we created a bacon day because I don't eat pork or red meat. So we once a year have bacon day as a family. <laughs> And that was kind of a fun thing that we did, we do, but, you know, con doing different types of activities, like I had a date day with myself. That was another day where I get up and choose what I want to do, whatever that looks like. And I'm prioritizing me. So as, as I did something I enjoy each day, I would also hear these other um, things to do that were also connecting to me. And of course, they just made me feel good. And it elevated my mood and I felt more connected to myself and I felt more full and therefore was able to give more to others. And that was really the whole, I didn't know that that was going to be the process of the book, but that's what happened. And so I recorded all of it and I knew what it, what it comes to me is meant to be shared with others. So that was really how the book came to be and the process and, and really the, the crux of the book is it's really a guide to connect to self. Absolutely. I love it. I love it. And I love how you talk about the cup, filling your cup, because I have a friend who's one of the first people that pushed me out of my way, out of my comfort zone, right? She, she was like, I see things in you, you need to get out there. But she's like, but the first thing you need to do is fill up your cup, make sure that you're doing, you know, your routine and the things that you practice, practice what you preach, right? And it's so important for us, because I know I'm like you, I started as a child, trying to help everyone around me and taking on their emotions and their pains, not realizing that I was doing that. Eventually it ended up getting into many health crises along the way until I finally decided to shift things and make that decision for myself. Um, and I know that you also experienced that where you had these negative patterns um, of putting others first since childhood. Can you let us know how that experience what went for you? Yeah, that's a great question. I, my mother was diagnosed uh, schizophrenic when I was nine months old, had started hearing voices. Eventually that changed to bipolar. But basically my entire childhood, she was in and out of psychiatrist's office and talking to different people, trying to fix her and find out what was wrong and why she was so depressed and why she would be in these really high level states of, of energy and then would dip down and was suicidal, unfortunately, frequently. And so my response as a child was to learn to read, the, read and sense and feel what was happening for her or, so I could have my basic needs met. So I would be able to be able to tell like if today was a low day, what I needed to do to make things happen. And we learned how to adapt. But she would also talk to me and share with me what was going on with her. And I would share with her my insights and my feelings and the things that I thought that she needed to hear. And she relied on me as her, she would call me her little psychiatrist and to, to support her. So I learned 
that pattern of I've got to help you in order to save me, in order to have my needs met. And so that began that pattern throughout my life, starting in early childhood of, oh, this is what I have to do to get my needs met. And some fashion, I've got to give to you. So of course, what do I, I end up, my mother took her life when I was a teenager and that freed up space for me to one, figure out who I was, which obviously took me a lot longer <laughs> than, you know, adolescence, but also to start to see that I could, I was starting to put, I just put energy in everyone else and not myself. So that became the pattern early on. I was always giving and listening and trying to help other people sort through their stuff. And also being so sensitive, I can, I can feel other people's feelings. I can feel their thought, thought patterns, literally. And that I'm so sensitive to that. I need to help you in order for me to feel better. So there was, that was going on too, you know, just really classic codependency type stuff. <clears throat> so I, it was the perfect classic caretaker as an early child. <clears throat> and then one, uh, to, went on to do that in my career, in my marriage, with my kids, until I had this moment of, wait, this is not working so well. <laughs> I am not, I'm not a part of this. Who's taking care of me? Nobody's taking care of me and recognizing that that was actually my choice and my responsibility. I like how you say that because really what it was, what's happening with you, your cup was half full the whole time because you were constantly giving and never really receiving what you needed. And that's where we get into these cycles where we end up having health crises and all these issues, mental health issues is because we continue to give and we're not supporting ourselves during our needy times and we need to make sure that we focus on ourselves in order to really be that person for everybody else yes, so i love yeah. how how you notice that well it's an imbalance of energy you know i'm an energy therapist i study energy patterns and the way that we thought the way that we think and the way that we feel and how that impacts us directly in our body and so i can see feel sense understand when we give out in certain fashions how it impacts us directly physically to, be, to the point of depletion and imbalance in our bodies until we rebalance where that energy is going. And if we don't have it come back in, we're always working from a place of depletion. There just isn't enough to fill us to keep going and moving in flow. Absolutely. I love how you said that because I've actually experienced that recently this week. There was some situation that had been avoided for a long time since we went in quarantine. I have a friend that lost her sister in the middle of the quarantine and we've been separated for a while because I'm working virtually and she's in the hospital. Um, so having that conversation with her for the first time, you know, for real, I could feel it in my body. I could feel it at my crown. And I, and I was just giving myself love and attention in that moment because I realized you're absorbing this again. Like this is your pattern. You need to stop it now. Um, and a lot of it requires some, some deep awareness within yourself of, of your patterns and what's going on. Mm -hmm. And also, right, especially with the pattern of why am I doing this? Why am in this moment, am I giving all my energy away? Because if it's not reciprocal in some fashion, then that's extremely damaging for us. And it's not always going to be reciprocal. You know, our relationships aren't designed like that, but it is, mm -hmm. we, it's our responsibility to rebalance the imbalances after a conversation or after a connection or after an argument with one of our family members, whatever that is to, okay, there's all this energy that went out, went out. How can I return it back to me? How can I give back to myself? That's a lot we, of control we have, and power that we have to do that too. Mm -hmm. And we can do that very quickly. There's, there's ways that you can shift it, which, which is why I started teaching this class, the seven day cleanses, because there's, there are easy ways that people can shift that energy and feel more balanced and have fun in yes. the middle of the craziness to just yes. let go of that. Like we were talking, we were talking about earlier, and that's why I said my first activity in my book is write a list of things that you enjoy. It doesn't have to be a crappy process. You can do things to change your mood and change your energy. One, yes, we want to feel our feelings. That's important, but we can also connect to joy. Like get up and do something that you like. Get up and start singing, dance around your house. Anything to shake that, shake it up, and return to you in that joyful state is doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to cost anything. It really doesn't. 
Absolutely. I think it's funny that you said sing and dance because that's one of the things I teach, sing and dance. I call it vocal release and dance release. And I like bringing in music that resonates with the client. So some clients might be, you know, in their 70s and their, their older songs or, or some might be more recent. Um, but really, we connect with music very deeply. And if we can release the emotions just by singing and moving our hips, it's so valuable and so fun to bring the joy in. Right. And so fun. So fun. So fun. <laughs> I saw in, in, your, uh, in your book that you also talk about forgiveness and how it was a really integral part of you forgiving your mom for that experience that you had from childhood until, until she took her life. Can you let us know a little bit about your forgiveness process? Sure. It took me a long time. You know, forgiveness is a practice. It's not a one-shot deal, certainly in my experience, because when we develop a wall of protection, it's meant so we don't get hurt over and over and over again. And we use anger as a tool to be able to keep that wall strong. So when any type of experience comes in that feels like that um, some sort of betrayal or like you, you're being put last or not prioritized, anger gets kicks right back up and says, okay, I know how this is gonna go. We're not, we're not doing this again. So when you have that longstanding pattern, it takes a bit to be able to see it when it's happening. And I would notice that I can remember particularly around a birthday. It wasn't, it was probably in the last six or seven years that I had my mother took her life a few days before my birthday. And so my birthday was always really challenging for me because it was a reminder of that time period. And it was hard to, for me, it was hard to connect, to celebrate because I was grieving. And I remember being so, so angry. And, and I was like, gosh, I thought I already did this. How many times do I have to forgive this process? But really, we, when we push our stuff down, it comes up in layers. And so that's why I believe that forgiveness is a practice and a process because we might forgive one moment or event or a feeling or whatever, but that doesn't mean it's gone forever. It might need another opportunity to come up again and come up again. So here I was, it was you know 20 something years later and I'm still angry on my birthday. Like, what are you, you know, really? Are we still doing this? And we were because there were still things that I had not resolved yet that were okay with me. And one of the biggest practices that helps me with forgiveness is to look at it from an outside perspective. I had an, a, an experience last year where my mother had come to me in a dream and we had connected and she hugged me and, it, and initially it felt very unsafe because that was not our connection. And that dream led to a whole series of events for me to connect with my mother in a way I had never experienced before. But one of the things that it did was pushed me to look at it from the outside as a woman in my 40s with children from that perspective of what would it have been like to be experiencing all of these things in this, during this, like what was her behavior suggesting, watching the things that she did. So being able to look at it from eyes of compassion as opposed to the eyes of a 14 year old who's ticked that you're not giving me a ride or that you won't, you don't ever care about my feelings because you're so focused on your own, that kind of stuff. Being able to look at it from the outside perspective is a real shifter in terms of being able to see things in a different light and being able to com engage compassion like you would for another human that you didn't have such high expectations for. And another piece is looking at my expectations. I always use the analogy, I don't know where this came from, but when you're expecting someone to run a marathon at the pace of two legs, but they only have one leg and there's nothing they can do to make another leg happen. Even the prosthetic might slow them down. And so I was looking at her thinking she should have been here, but she only had one leg. She would never be able to do that. She was never gonna have two legs. So me having the expectation of her being able to achieve that was only setting myself up for disappointment. So doing that certainly with my mother and then also with other people of how realistic is it that these people have all these skills and abilities that I think they should have versus what's actually really happening. That's an interesting take on it. And I agree that um, we continue to re-experience these things and experience new emotions as we're learning. In my section of the book, I actually talk about how it's peeling an onion. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you, you heal, you, you repair, you forgive, and you continue to experience these things as you evolve through that journey of learning yourself and how you perceive the environment and conversations and situations that happen in order to relive those experiences that we had so long ago. Absolutely. When, it, when the next trigger yeah. comes up and you're like, what? 
exactly. That triggers, it's an opportunity is what I'm teaching my clients now. It's an opportunity to evolve. It's, let's not think of it as a trigger or a challenge. It's an opportunity for you to grow. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that you talk about is the parent, how you can become the parent protector and friend you always wanted. And I love that because what I'm teaching right now is how can we support our inner child, our current self and our future self which is very, very similar to what you're saying, right? Because our, our future self would be our parent um, giving us everything that we need mm -hmm. to evolve and grow. So let us know a little bit about this little secret that you share. I got to tell you, I rejected that for a very long time, the whole inner child thing, because I did not want to revisit. When I first started studying psychology, I remember being just kind of disgusted. Like, why do we always have to talk about our past? Why do we have to talk about our child? Like, why aren't, haven't we moved on? Let's deal with the here and now. And because I, want, I was taking that practical approach, like, we're uncomfortable now. Let's move forward. And then realizing that I was really just avoiding it because I didn't want to experience the pain from the past. So one of my practices that I do, and this actually happened to me in meditation, and I was sitting in my little peaceful place. I was imagining myself at the, at the lake and my inner child, my little girl self came and sat in my lap. And I was like, what are you doing here? <laughs> and we just started having a conversation of she was telling me how she felt and I was responding and listening to her the way that I would with my children. And this is certainly something I talk about with my clients. When I talk to my clients, I'm talking to them from a voice of a, of a mother or the wise self. So, and how am I speaking to myself? Not usually, it's more that sort of tisk tisk, right? So learning to, learning to talk to self, learning to slow down and hear the conversations in the head, to know what is it that I'm telling myself in the regular and how can I cut in and be that wise self that I am for everyone else, to be that mother that I am for everyone else, to be that parent for myself. And that has been, an extremely rewarding practice. You could do that in your head. I like also writing it down. It kind of looks like different things. Sometimes I'll write down, you know, a really practical one is what's my fear and whatever my fear is at the moment. And then I'll ask, okay, what's the truth? The truth is that fear has never happened before. I've got, I've had that fear a bazillion times before. It's never come to be. So learning how to talk to myself in such a way that's much more nurturing and much more loving and much more kind. I love that. I love that you said that. My son almost walked in in the middle yeah. of this one. That's so funny. Um, we're getting ready to wrap up. We have about two minutes left, but I think you're right. I think it's so important for us to, to become the parent to ourselves and to shift those messages that come in our mind. Cause I know mine tends to be very negative a lot of the time. So I'll be writing notes at, at night to prepare for a lesson that I'm going to teach the next day. And for some reason that may be something that brings stress on. So I'll, I'll make it a habit of writing down an affirmation and then signing it at the bottom. Like this is going to happen because I wrote this affirmation. And when I read this next time, I'm going to remember the positive thoughts that I had and push myself forward. So I like how you brought that in. Can you uh, give us a little heads up of how they can reach out to you? Any last little phrase or quotes that you want to give before we close out? Well, the best way to reach me is on my website at livingwithserendipity.com. I'm also, this is my same name, I'm Living with Serendipity on Facebook as well as Instagram. And, you know, I really, I like digging into fear. Fear to me is, is one of the things that dictates our lives in a lot of ways with our patterns. And so recognizing that the antidote to fear is trust, that trust is the antidote to fear. So the more that we are connected to trust and the more that we trust ourselves, the more that we can move through our fears and live our lives more fully. I love that. Thank you. So I invite all my listeners to trust themselves and take some time to go within and breathe and relax. We both agree that nature is important. So make sure you go outside and get some fresh air today and feel more balanced within yourself. We hope this show was inspirational. This is Diane Vick and my guest Lynn Riley, and we're saying goodbye for today. Aloha.